Uh, I get to bring in with you all um, a good industry friend of mine, but also uh, a mover and shaker extraordinaire. You might say the same thing about some others, but uh, Rich Lukaj is here with me. He is the managing partner of Bank Street. And I got to tell you guys, uh, 20 years of investment banking experience. Um, he has been part of well over 200 deals in the industry, totaling over $100 billion in transactions. And, you know, we're going to be talking today, um, you know, about what Bank Street does um, and some of what they're doing in our space in regards to helping companies with uh, financial and strategic goals. Uh, they are a private uh, investment banking company um, helping uh, companies in our sector, um, in the communications media and technology sectors. And uh, it is my honor to welcome you, Rich. Thank you for being here. I'm delighted to be here as well. Uh, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for that kind introduction, especially since that 20-year uh, uh, landmark uh, was eclipsed probably almost 10 years ago now. So uh, <laughs> That's why I said well over 200 deals <laughs> doing in the past couple of years alone. Um, speaking of deals, um, let's talk about some of the recent transactions that you and the Bank Street team have been across, because I think they're super interesting and it will be a great you know, baseline for us to work with. Well, look, I think uh, you know, for, for the broader audience, perhaps it's worth noting that uh, Bank Street is a, uh, a very focused investment bank uh, at the mm -hmm. epicenter of uh, digital infrastructure and services. Um, we broadly uh, call ourselves a TMT practice, although it's a firm heavily focused on uh, recurring revenue uh, theme, so we don't we don't get involved in uh, very very nascent technology plays uh, or uh, um, uh, or sort of R and D type situations or film production and things of that sort. But uh, you know anything uh, within the realm of cable, uh, telephony, satellite, wireless, wireline, all of the underlying infrastructure uh, that supports all of those kinds of service layers, uh, the data center ecosystem, of course, and uh, uh, more broadly, uh, the services companies that leverage those uh, uh, infrastructure layers to provide services to their end customers, those are all in, in, in sort of the fairway focus for our, for our platform. So in, in that context, as you can imagine, the last year in particular, um, you know, in the post-COVID environment, there have been a variety of accelerants that affected the uh, that ecosystem as folks uh, uh, became far more distributed in their in their work environments, and uh, that in effect uh, created a whole new slew of uh, infrastructure demands as folks demanded services similar to their work environments to be made available to them uh, in their in their home environments in many cases or in remote environments as the case may be, um, and uh, that obviously put a tax on uh, everything from. Uh, uh, the most elementary part of the uh, uh, communications infrastructure layer to all of the storage array security layers, uh, every other uh, application proposition that uh, one could hope for. Right, right. So as a result of all of that, right, what have you been seeing and what have you been across in regards to uh, whether it's the type of transactions, the type of a consolidation that's taking shape, the, the, the funding for expansion opportunities, right? What's kind of the flavor that's making that up? Uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, is hard to ignore is that there are phenomenons that are developing uh, on a global scale this time around. So it's not as regional mm -hmm. center drivers as we might have seen in, in prior iterations uh, uh, in the past, uh, we, for example, were involved in a transaction where KKR uh, got involved with a, uh, 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 an opportunity to acquire the underlying infrastructure from Telefonica in Chile. And uh, that case study is a, a uh, way in which we see happening in a variety of markets uh, whereby new capital partners are taking underlying infrastructure, which, you know, the liquidity event of which provides 
to Telefonica financial flexibility and, and, and the ability to focus on services and customer care while the infrastructure layer investor has that ongoing uh, Telefonica association with their customers as a major uh, wholesale consumer of the underlying infrastructure, but also opens that uh, infrastructure company to the ability to serve others and those infrastructure investors to have the ability to actually have uh, the role of uh, being the core foundational layer infrastructure in the provisioning of services in those markets. Uh, we're involved in a similar transaction in Brazil at the moment that has uh, the potential to really transform uh, that country in terms of its broadband capabilities in, in ways that we have never seen before. Uh, on the domestic front, we uh, announced a transaction for a company called Metronet uh, this morning. Uh, we're very proud to be associated with that company as it has really been the uh, the flag bearer in terms of delivering fiber to the home in, in a variety of markets uh, throughout the country uh, and are excited to see uh, uh, the investors there uh, backing the Sidelli family to uh, continue to drive the uh, ongoing success of that business. And uh, that actually marks our ninth transaction um, in the last two years uh, in that arena and providing this proliferation of fiber to uh, uh, to the uh, to the premises of uh, homes or small businesses and others that have previously not had these capabilities uh, before. So, you know, obviously there's, um, you know, been talk, right, infrastructure funding from the federal government and all of that, um, you know, bridging the digital divide and, um, you know, expanding into greater markets, uh, creating more competition, uh, which helps to uh, reduce costs for end users or buyers of services because uh, that's just the nature of competition. And so, you know, you, you talked a little bit about what you saw during the pandemic. What's the outcome of that, right? You know, there was activity while we were in it where, we're, you know, we've got a toe, right? A big toe um, sticking out um, from on the other side of this pandemic, but there's still a lot of work to get done. So what is that looking like? So, uh, you know, there's a few layers to that. Uh, I think on the one hand, um, the the on the topic of the government involvement in broadband infrastructure, I, I think that's something that needs to be uh, handled with care. Uh, there there are a lot of capital dollars being deployed from in, incumbent players in, in some of these markets to actually upgrade and provide a higher grade of service to their constituency. It's also coming from insurgents that are looking to edge out and get into uh, some of these markets on a competitive level. Uh, and whether it's the incumbent telco or cable co, as the case may be, we're seeing we're seeing that in abundance with uh, announce, announcements of uh, record levels uh, of investment in the uh, capital layer to do those very things. And in addition to that, you have all categories of entrepreneurs coming at some of these markets in a variety of ways as well. Some with a niche on E-rate solutions, some with a niche on uh, wireless infrastructure augmentation, some with a niche on... Uh, uh, a blend of commercial and uh, residential capabilities, some with pure residential motivation. So um, I think it's a very vibrant arena. And while uh, the possibility of incremental capital being made available uh, from the government uh, is particularly interesting, uh, I'm absolutely hopeful that we don't have some of the, uh, 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 I guess, uh, inexperienced approaches that were taken before wasted a lot of taxpayer dollars, but rather that this capital is uh, thoughtfully deployed in public-private partnership in a way that doesn't squeeze out commercial uh, viable operators and, and, or weaken them, as the case may be, um, by virtue of uh, government insurgency into the, uh, uh, into the pricing umbrella, because I, I don't think uh, it's a step forward necessarily for the nation to have uh, the government be the underlying provisioner of, uh, of uh, comms infrastructure for the future. Right. I mean, you know, we can get into a whole political discussion about that, but we won't. Right. But, you know, we can look at it as, you know, you know, perhaps as a subsidy, right. To, to help make it more affordable, to help, um, you know, increase opportunity to, for build outs and all that. But I think, Alyssa, on that point, I would say my comments really weren't intended to be political. They, they, right. they, they, they may sound so because I, I, I can imagine already uh, with your reaction that uh, folks can easily politically charge the topic. But uh, 
there are there are tangible experiences to point to, whether it's BTOP spheres or others that uh, uh, we have tangible experiences of what doesn't work particularly well. Uh, I think the, the, the subsidy elements are a relatively modest part of the overall capital allocation here. So I don't think the subsidy elements properly targeted are gonna be that terribly objectionable. Uh, it's gonna be the question of whether or not you want uh, municipal, state, or other agencies to be oh, nice. the underlying providers and, and carriers of, of, of uh, the next generation. And to me, that, that begs a lot of consideration because you guys had a bunch of panels here earlier today, even on topics of security attention um, uh, and other layers of engagement that uh, uh, that play into this. And, you know, I think it's best left to uh, the competitive and economic and entrepreneurial dynamics that are already fervent in the marketplace. There are a lot of ways to actually economically incentivize um, that government or to use that government money to economically incentivize further deepening penetration into markets that might not otherwise be commercially viable. And I think there are a lot of really thoughtful ways to do that using traditional finance technology. And uh, uh, I'm hopeful that that's the pathway in the framework of public-private partnership that this goes about because it results in employment, further proliferation of networks, and actually a strengthening of the relative uh, competitors that are in the marketplace versus the, the, the broad uh, weakening of all of the existing operators in, in the market. Yeah, well, thank you for that because you're you're right, right? We don't want our municipalities to be our service providers for telco or, or internet services or even wireless, right? That's not their business. That's this industry's business, right? And so you bring in the, the professionals and you do it through a partnership, the public-private partnerships that enable the professional care uh, oversight uh, and, and service quality that uh, in, we need. I would even go as far as to say that you could, in fact, allow for these uh, deployment and development initiatives to enable for private networks that might well uh, be exclusively at the service of uh, private networking needs of municipalities or various agencies, et cetera, as part and parcel of uh, providing leverage, reduced cost, and other elements that enable uh, more fringe, fringe economic opportunities to become uh, um, viable. So yeah. I think there's a lot of ways to think about this stuff in a very constructive way. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, I know that there's a lot of people engaged on this topic as we speak, but uh, I'm hopeful that we can help people navigate to a place where this this use of taxpayer money is uh, is targeted in a way that it really makes a difference to uh, uh, to the intended result, but also in, in terms of fortifying our industries, uh, uh, various players uh, in totality, and, and hopefully uh, continuing to edge out uh, the American uh, uh, experience in terms of the, the viability of players. Awesome. Well, I'm going to shift um, my question here because uh, I'm really curious. Um, you know, we've both been in the industry. 25 plus years, right, or so. And, you know, through the evolution of the industry, we've seen different buckets of areas of investment kind of, you know, be hot topics, you know, years, and it kind of, you know, moves all around. So we had subsea to data centers, to metro networks, to regional networks, to national, international, right, the whole gamut. Then we had the you know, the software layers and, you know, the the orchestration capabilities and uh, the technology and the security. I'm curious, from your perspective, um, has this pandemic changed the way that people are looking at those infrastructure opportunities? Because we kind of need everything in many ways, right, is, is, is my question. Or is there still a hot area of interest that maybe outshines some other areas? So I'll take that from the point of view of what we're seeing capital doing. Um, and um, there are no doubt um, material segments of, and I'll, I'll focus on the US first and perhaps more broadly thereafter as well. So uh, there's no doubt that there's a demand side equation in the US uh, with 20 some odd million uh, homes that still have, I would consider, an inadequate 
commercially viable uh, uh, broadband offering to them in the current backdrop. That's being pursued by a variety of uh, different technologies, whether it's uh, you know 5G proliferation, which may edge out to cover some part of that market opportunity, whether it's uh, uh, point to multi-point uh, wireless solutions, particularly in rural uh, marketplaces or, or even more traditional microwave solutions where appropriate. Uh, there's fiber edging ever closer to a lot of these opportunities in, in terms of both residential and commercial uh, deployment. Um, there's also obviously data center uh, demand that is a byproduct of not just this proliferation uh, geographically, and, and some of the latency sensitive types of propositions are going to open up uh, um, uh, more edge uh, requirements, uh, as the case may be, and, and in other cases, as as is obvious, some of the online businesses that uh, serve billions, in some cases, uh, consumers around the world, the the processing capability of of uh, the creation, storage, and distribution of all of that content or information, as the case may be, um, is fueling a tremendous uh, wholesale and hyperscaler type of uh, data center proliferation at the same time. So people oftentimes, maybe at a macro level, bundle all of these themes together and it just seems like a big wave of one kind or another. I would caution on that a little bit to say that there are indeed very, very uh, sliced sub-segments and very, very different trends within microcosms of all of these industry sectors. We're, we're very proud uh, to have been on average 25, 30 years of average tenure among our senior team, uh, active across all of these spaces since infancy or even since starting uh, in the first waves of deregulation in some cases and in other cases since the first independent data centers were, were, were started in the early 90s. We were among those uh, very few who saw a trend uh, for the future and uh, worked on capitalizing and, and, and strategically aligning these businesses to create some of the companies that are the venerable brands of our day today. Um, we're very proud of uh, uh, the team we've assembled, and I think we're fairly unique in the marketplace and the ability to help people think through how they've positioned themselves competitively, strategically, how to access the most efficient and effective capital uh, for the next phase of a company's evolution. Um, I would say on the international stage, the themes are very different as well in terms of what they're playing for. Uh, I think it, it is often driven by some similar priorities and, and those are, you know, what is the competitive realm um, and what is the universe of uh, viable options that are, that are available? I mean, in some markets, in fact, the government has provided an underlying infrastructure upon which everybody leverages. Uh, in other cases, you have a very vibrant competitive dynamic among you know a small group of uh, constituencies uh, and some places are more uh, attractive for entrepreneurs than others um, all of those are, are, are considerations on the competitive front then you have the regulatory dynamic which in some cases is fostering you know a, a duopoly style orientation in some cases is, is fostering a very pro-competitive disposition or like in the us occasionally swinging to both extremes of that uh, perspective. Um, you know, I think, uh, candidly, on the regulatory side, we like to see stability over, um, you know, having a, uh, you know, an adept preference, per se, of, of one extreme or the other. Although, I think it's fair to say that uh, given, given the progress that has been made on the comms infrastructure side in the U.S. Uh, over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, uh, it's clear that uh, a, a considerable element of competitive dynamic has been very, very healthy to sort of the duopoly disposition that uh, that existed in the U.S. for, for a very long time. Um, having said that, a swing too far has also shown that uh, it creates a lot of really fragile companies um, and, you know, with insurgents or, or incumbents, if you will, um, in some cases, you know, becoming, becoming weakened by the burden of all the competition in certain elements of their business. And, and while they themselves are trying to be insurgents and in the wireless arena and otherwise. Um, it's also fair to say that the technology side is a big variable. So uh, a lot of folks are watching to see, for example, what uh, Charlie Ergen and Dish are gonna do in, in terms of the effects on, uh, on the wireless arena. And that has obviously uh, likewise some effects uh, potentially viable as certain sub-segments of the wireline space. And you've got uh, uh, Elon Musk making uh, 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 
considerable steps towards uh, providing satellite solutions for some parts of the market as well. And all of these are, are, are part of the, the dialogue per se, but uh, I think at the end of the day, before people make broad stroked uh, comments about what the implications are, it's really important to get into the weeds and understand what the specific business model is of a particular company and understand how that uh, juxtaposes on all of these layers of topics. Uh, and then that also uh, is important to juxtapose on uh, the geographies and, and other sort of geographic drivers that, uh, that, that play into the strategies as well. Right, so um, you know we are just about out of time, but I am gonna ask you one question. Uh, which is two layers to it. And that is really the the, the gist of, you know, what, what I, I'm so curious about is um, what improves valuation for businesses, number one, and number two, for companies who are looking to reposition themselves financially, what should they be working on? And it could be the same answer, but I think we touched a little bit upon the valuation aspect, but not quite in that direct way. Right. Uh, it's a good question. I don't think it's uh, uh, a plain vanilla answer across the board, but I will say in, in generic terms, um, you know, obviously valuation improves as you can have demonstrated growth that is sustainable, defensible, um, and uh, deemed to be a long-term uh, annuity type uh, platform. That's something the company can do something about. Um, in addition to that, there's an externality, which is what's the overall uh, risk environment, volatility backdrop, and, and broader cost of capital uh, uh, environment. And that is something that the company cannot do much about other than choose the windows in time in which they, they seek to evaluate access to capital or other valuation relevant uh, milestones for their business. Um, those tend to be uh, very attractive um, uh, in a backdrop like the one we have today. Uh, and in fact, I would say today, you have an added variable that is also an externality, which is there are an extraordinary number of uh, businesses and capital sources that want to be in this arena. Uh, you have, uh, all kinds of REITs that are trying to diversify, in some cases, out of commercial real estate and into what I'll call comms infrastructure type real estate. Um, you have uh, everything from sovereign funds to LPs of every infrastructure fund seeking for direct access to opportunities, either as co-investors or as uh, funding providers to various uh, fund complexes around the world that are exploring these kinds of market opportunities on their behalf. That is you know, unprecedented level engagement with folks that have very long durations on their investment horizons and, uh, and a, a very patient capital disposition as evidenced even in the most volatile times and other kinds of infrastructure that they're involved in like uh, travel infrastructure and uh, oil and gas infrastructure, et cetera. And last year, all of those were tested simultaneously with great volatility. And these, uh, these capital sources, uh, I think have also seen to it that those funds that early on got involved in digital infrastructure as part of their blends saw last year that their volatility was much better. And as a result, I think we're seeing a significant wave of activity to get to uh, a meaningful per percentage um, of these digital, I'm sorry, of infrastructure funds having a digital component to their diet. And uh, I think uh, I think that's still in its relatively early innings and we're seeing that uh, uh, across transactions of every variety uh, in the space, really on the world stage, because these infrastructure funds uh, exist and have either targeted geographic opportunities as that they like, or uh, or a global perspective in, in many of the larger cases that uh, are playing out themes, not just in North America, but, but other parts of the world as well. So if I can summarize it, right? A steady, consistent growth business is attractive for opportunities and there is a um there isn't a very large interest in investing in this space because of trajectory of opportunity for growth in the future and the um the rates right making it attractive to do so right to borrow to refinance and and to make things happen it's uh it, it's cheaper right than it has been in, in some years past so it makes it a, a lot more reasonable to do that. So, so you you have that combination, and you know, 
you could do a lot more with that. Uh, that sounds simplistic, but but it's all true, uh, Alyssa. But I think the, the one thing I would say is that it's not new. I mean, the, the, the cost of capital backdrop has been very constructive now for a number of years. Yep. And I think that cost of capital backdrop has fueled some of the phenomenal achievements that have been made uh, across all of these sectors in the last five plus years. Um, and uh, I think even the example of the pandemic uh, economic yeah. disruptions uh, were not able to thwart um, any of these dispositions or trends. And in fact, in some subsectors, uh, it was accelerated by what the pandemic revealed. Right. Um yeah, it's it, it's interesting. The next conversation we're going to have is about crypto. Just want you to know. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole other ball of wax. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's always a pleasure to speak to you, Rich. Thank you so much for for being here today, for sharing your wisdom, um, folks. If uh, you know you're interested to to chat with Rich and the Bank Street team, uh, you know, feel free to reach out uh, to Rich directly um, or through me. Happy to put you in touch. Um, you know, great. Uh, leading thought leader and uh, expert on uh, our space and uh, certainly a guiding light for many, many companies. So thank you. Well, thank you, Alyssa. Those are very kind comments and uh, my team and I uh, uh, would be delighted to speak to any of your uh, companies that are, that are playing in this arena. And uh, um, as I said, on a couple of occasions here on this discussion, there are no plain vanilla answers to these uh, very company specific type opportunities and or challenges as the case may be. And uh, uh, we'd be delighted to, uh, to have those conversations and uh, hopefully uh, be able to help uh, uh, many of your constituents here as well. You got it, thank you.